Welcome everyone to our uh, liver multi-scan in the management of diffuse liver disease, practical and clinical considerations uh, launch on symposium. Uh, I want to thank everybody for your interest. Uh, thank you to SAR 2023. This is the, the first time that we, that we work together and that we are um, sponsoring this uh, society. Um, it's very, very, very interesting. We have three very good presenters today, three experts uh, with a lot of experience in using uh, liver multiscan. Um, we are going to start with Dr. Nadej Gon, who will tell you why she needs liver multiscan now. Then uh, we're going to hear a lot about the science behind uh, liver multiscan. And finally, from a radiologist perspective, how liver multiscan is uh, implemented in a, in a radiology department, uh, plus some case studies that, again, Dr. Gon will talk to you about. So with no further ado, Dr. Gon, please. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to discuss this really exciting technology, liver multi-scan. I had the privilege of actually using this in 2017 here when I practiced in Austin, and it was really more of a clinical research entity at that time. And then in 2019, it was commercially available here in Austin for us to use, and it really has been a game changer for my practice and my confidence in treating liver patients. But why now? Why do we need liver multi-scan in our practice now? And there's two really large reasons for that. And one is the guidelines. Within the last year, five different practice guidelines have come down the pike utilizing or encouraging providers to use the corrected T1 technology, which you'll hear more about later. On the left of the screen, you see the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease clinical practice guidelines that is asking us when we're looking at patients with NASH and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease to utilize liver multi-scan and correct a T1 to help stratify those patients. Also on the right of, this, of the slide, you can see a New England Journal of Medicine article that just came out this year that talks about hemochromatosis and the liver iron concentration that this technology can provide us in managing these patients. And lastly, and pretty importantly, is AIM recently has asked that liver multi-scan and this type of technology be incorporated in um, in the diagnosis of fatty liver disease and other chronic liver disease, that it's medically necessary that we utilize this technology. And as you may know, AIM informs CMS and thus informs other payers regionally and nationally to, um, to use clinically meaningful technology for the management of patients with liver disease. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tannenbaum, who'll talk about the science behind the technology. Thank you. You know, I have a lot of friends out in the room here in, uh, in uh, GI imaging, body imaging, and most of them are wondering why anybody would have me come up here and talk about science. Um, the, other, the other folks who aren't warning about that know that I'm a you know, neuroradiologist by training, but uh, may, if you know me well enough, know that I've spent my entire career working at the cutting edge of MR and CT and, uh, and translating it, developments that we've had through the last 25, 30 years into day-to-day -day clinical practice. So I got asked today to talk about the value of quantitative liver imaging. Actually, that's not true. I get to talk about the fundamental integrity behind quantitative liver imaging measures and monitoring uh, diffuse liver disease. And I think more erudite and experienced folks will talk about the clinical impact and what it means. Now, even more friends in the room, I see, as I'm, as I'm looking around. So, Liver multi-scan um, is essentially a tool to provide quantitative measures for liver disease. And you know, obviously this room is really quite aware of what those potentials are. And um, they measure iron, and we'll talk about how they do it. They do protein density fat fraction in, in their way, and I'll talk about how they do it. And you'll hear over and over again how corrected T1 is a unique measure that they can provide and its significance. The key thing about all of this is that you're working on multiple different machines and different vendors, different field strengths, uh, uh, different generations, and uh, whenever you're doing quantitative imaging, it's really important that, that the measures are standardized and reproducible across all of the machines that you use. I see one of my colleagues in there, and he probably has, Evan, I see you, and uh, have multiple different uh, 
even in this practice. Now, when we, uh, Evans practice merges with the New York City practice and merges with, you know, works in the Delaware practice, you know, we, you know it's very hard to get patients to go back to the same machine each individual. It's basically very hard means you can't do it. So it's really important that you have uh, measures that translate. And of course, we're talking about FDA cleared CE marked applications that are essentially, you know, con they're contrast free and they work on standard clinical scanners that may appear. So you'll hear about from me as well as from the other folks that are working in the field, liver iron concentration, uh, proton density fat fraction and iron corrected T1, which frankly is the more interesting concept, you know, physics wise. So liver iron concentration, you know how this is done. It's, it's a 10 second breath hold. Um, it is a standardized, reliable way to convert the T2 star mapping that we all can get to uh, iron content. And it is done in a way that is both field strength and scanner independent or consistent. And that's really the big advance. Um, it also, you know, I, I'm an administrator for a large company. Uh, uh, every opportunity to fail will happen in those circumstances, whether you're doing a test bolus or doing a calculation um, to convert one measure to the other, it's nice to not to have to do these conversions and lead to that, that and dispose yourself to the potential for those types of errors. So, as you can see, there are publications on this. This has been lots of different me methods to measure liver iron. Uh, I think they've all coalesced on the technique that my friend Scott Reeder developed over in Wisconsin, but he was not, clearly not the, the, the first pioneer in, in this space. But uh, I think the world is now moving to some version of what Scott and, my, and, and the folks at University of Wisconsin have done, which is the, uh, the ideal IQ method or ideal method. Um, you can see the scale that the things work on. And I think one of the key magical pieces about this software is that it produces measurements that you can rely upon with very small incremental changes. Uh, uh, and, and again, whenever you look at anything we measure quantitatively, whether it's a, a lung nodule or you know, liver iron, you wanna know how much change is real change and how much change is noise. And the nice thing about their validations is it shows that 0 0.3 milligrams per gram or larger is a real change. I think that's important when you look at the scale of what iron accumulates after a single uh, blood transfusion, which is roughly double that. So it's really nice to have the ability to rely upon this. And again, the, this was FDA clear for both field strengths you know, in 2002. Now, potent density fat fraction, loads and loads of papers out there for how this is done. Um, uh, and over the course, you know, it's an accepted biomarker, but over time it now accounts for T2 star effects, multiple fat peaks, and T1 effects. These are all innate to the, to the considerations you have every day. But what may not be innate and is that the numbers don't really translate between the vendors. I think that's really important. And now you could say, well, maybe 20 years ago, you were all GE, you are all Siemens, you are all Philips, but that's not the way it works today. As a matter of fact, I get the phone calls when the measures on one machine don't match up to the other machine as if I can fix it, you know, as a technical lead for our organization. You know, we have 350 cent plus centers at RadNet with um, 300 MR scanners. Okay, just try and imagine that. Or and try telling your scheduling people, oh no, with this patient went to the uh, 1.5T Phillips of a certain generation last time, they've got to go back again. It's, it's a disaster. So scientifically, it is important to know that things, while the vendors are internally consistent enough for our day-to-day -day work, there is big inconsistencies across the vendors. This has been published and shown. So there's essentially a bias between the machines uh, uh, or a variance between vendors, which really makes it difficult to do longitudinal surveillance, which as you'll hear from the clinicians speaking today, um, as well as the radiologist who lives in this space every day, uh, this is an important consideration. So what you get, you know, from the liver multi-scan uh, is a measure of liver fat. You know, this correlates with the steatosis we see on liver biopsy, which is the fraction of hepatic cells containing fat. Again, is a simple 10-second breath hold, very reproducible, and, and you can see the range in which it reports. And the segmentation, you know, in 2022 is always assisted by artificial intelligence. Um, but the key thing is you have one tool that your practice can go to, one set of numbers you've got to get comfortable with, one format that the data comes out, and I think that's a big advance. And you can see from these publications that um, there's really a high level of consistency uh, at both field strengths uh, in the same patients going to multiple sites, and that's what you want, good, reliable numbers. You know, the significance of those numbers determined clinically in research 
um, but you certainly want to have numbers that you can rely upon visit the visit. And that's really where I think you're gonna see, you know, the key point of this presentation is, is really about the inte fundamental integrity of the data. I think it's really important to have that very tight longitudinal reproducibility. You can see the numbers up there, the reproducibly reducibility coefficient between scanners around plus or minus 2.2%. Within a scanner, 1.9%. Uh, and, you know, statistically, this means that a shift in proton density fat fraction of just 2% is a valid change. Uh, and I think that's important to have the longitudinal changes that you see are meaningful. Yeah, you know, I mentioned earlier, one of the hidden things that we really don't understand is that there's a lot of, you know, if you're looking, say, at a lung nodule, how much change is real? You know, if we're here, we have that sense of how much change is real so we won't uh, overestimate or underestimate. All right. Now, T1 measurements. You know, T1 measurements are used in a lot of different tissues. They're being used uh, in, in the liver, obviously, quite a bit. You know, if you think about liver tissue, it's, you know, healthy cells with an extracellular space. There is a, uh, there's a nucleus, there's a little bit of iron. Um, this is not my liver, by the way. I'm pretty sure my liver would not qualify for the normal T1 values. Too much time spent down the road. And again, you look at the T1 relaxation times of tissues, and when we start talking about the derangements, it's kind of important to, to consider what makes T1 relaxation times. You know, when you have a relatively structured environment, the T1 relaxation times are shorter. When you have a homogeneous environment, like in water, the T1 relaxation times get longer, which is why in a T1-weighted image, you know, the gallbladder is dark, but the liver is relatively bright, because that tissue recovers more quickly. So when you get a diseased liver, which as I'm sure everyone here knows, you get uh, 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 the cells shrink, you get a bit of extracellular uh, 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 activity that leads to increased extracellular fluid. Uh, with increased fluid uh, in the extracellular space, you're going to have that shift to the, the water type environment and you're going to get a lengthening of the T1. Um, when you get into um, the fact that in the diseased liver you also have iron. Iron, you know, is like when you think about a magnetic experiment, you know, it's about how long that signal persists, how long it takes to recover, right? Um, that homogeneous environment leads to long persistence. You put a magnet in the middle of that space, a ferromagnetic object in the middle of that tissue, and immediately all the signal gets lost. It all gets out of phase. So essentially with iron, you make the T1 recovery much faster, with water you make it much longer. If you have iron with the water, you're gonna get numbers all over the place. I mean, that's just MR physics. Uh, how that plays out in day-to-day -day practice, I think you're better experts. MR physics says iron's working against the effects that are happening with the T1. It's just that's the way it works. Um, so it was a natural to think about, could you correct the T1 value for the presence of iron so you got reliable information from that data? And that's what liver multi-scan provides, this unique measure, this corrected T1. Uh, again, just a breath hold, um, just the automatic segmentation, but it's something that happens by itself. So essentially, you now can get a, a, a liver iron concentration map from the T2 star. You can see what happened, what the image might look like without correction. You get a number of 818 milliseconds. Um, uh, in this case, which may not suggest disease, but when you correct for the iron and uh, don't mask the changes in T1, you end up with a number that points towards disease, and I think that's really important. Um, again, and it's also important to know that this works on all the manufacturers in a consistent way. Is it important? Well, you know, there are the, the publications are available out there. Jay Swalb pointed out in 2020 that uh, using the corrected T1 as a measure uh, showed that it enhances the risk of severe clinical outcomes, including liver transplant and death. You can see from this chart, you know, when the, when the corrected T1 values are in the normal range, the outcomes do pretty well. When they start shifting above the normal range, you start to get into poorer outcomes. So, this has been evaluated in, in a number of different conditions, uh, uh, autoimmune hepatitis, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, hepatitis C, and it's been shown that the corrected T1 correlates with the markers of disease activity. You can see across the different bins, across these studies, you know, across the different levels of you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and, and fibrosis, you can see that there's a good performance across the way and how they correlate with the corrected T1 values based on those activity scores and fibrosis scores. So, um, 
Honestly, to do things right in uh, medicine today, you've got to have the publications. And if you're a company, you've got to support the publications. And there's over 40 publications now that point to the value of the corrected T1 measure. Um, and I think that's very reassuring as well as encourages you to move in that direction. So the key thing to remember about this, and again, in my, work, my line of work, everything is about standardization. It's very hard to make good quality if you're not producing a standardized product, but standardized across the scanners, tight reproducibility along longitudinal measurement, which I think is a key factor here. Um, statistically, a change in corrected T1 of 40 milliseconds is considered reliable, and uh, 80 milliseconds is, is considered clinically meaningful. And uh, their data, you know, validated in, in those, uh, I was about to say innumerable, but I just told you 40, so I guess you can put a number on it. Uh, over 800 milliseconds indi indicates disease activity is present. And I think this is, you know, solid information. So, um, without putting, you know, without taking too much time, we've talked about liver iron concentration. We've talked about how they do proton density fat fraction to make it standardized and, and useful for longitudinal measurements. And you've heard from me about corrected T1. I think that's what you'll hear the most about over the next uh, few minutes with the other speakers. So um, thank you for indulging me as a technical guy up here in front of a room of clinical uh, experts in body imaging. And thank you for your attention. Okay, so Dr. Tannenbaum nicely illustrated the science behind the technology. And now I want to take you to the clinical side of things, how we apply this in practice and why this is so clinically useful. Okay, so as a hepatologist, my job is to ensure, especially around non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, that my primary care colleagues know when to refer to me so I can take it a few steps higher and clinically stratify the patient. So this slide nicely illustrates what we ask of our primary care and how we then become involved. So as you can see at the top of the screen, if a primary care doctor has a clinical suspicion for fatty liver, say the person's obese, diabetic, has metabolic syndrome, we ask them to calculate a FIB4, which is a quick point of care calculation that uses AST, ALT, and platelets. They can put an app on their phone or Google it. And if that FIB4 calculation is less than 1.3, they can conservatively manage that patient. They can ask that patient to diet, exercise, eat more of a Mediterranean diet, and that should be enough. When that FIB4 is in an indeterminate range, then we do rely on some additional things. There's an ELF test, which is an enhanced liver uh, fibrosis test that they can do. It's a blood test. It'll help them know if the patient's high or low risk. Or they can do VCTE, which we've talked about maybe earlier. That's vibration-controlled transient elastography, also known as FibroScan commercially. That can help stratify. But when that FIB4 is high, as you can see on the right side of the screen, greater than 2.67, that means that the liver is probably fibrotic, that the patient could have NASH, that there's more advanced risk there, and then we take it from there. We want to know, is this real? Do we have to biopsy these patients? Do we need more information? And this is where the liver multi-scan ties in nicely because you get that heat map, if you will, that color mapping of a green liver, meaning good, an orangey yellow liver, meaning not so good, and then a red liver, meaning really bad. And that's really nice for us to see as simple clinicians and also for our patients when we describe what's going on. So I want to take you through two quick cases. This is a fatty liver disease diagnosis in a 66-year-old diabetic male whose BMI is just 22, so he's not really a heavy individual. His AST and ALT are normal. His FIB4 is 1.45, which is on the lower end, so it's telling me maybe there's not really advanced disease here. But the VCTE, or fiber scan, vibration controlled transient elastography, is at 10.7 which tells me that there could be some fibrosis in this individual. So now I'm getting mixed messages and not sure if this guy is an indeterminate risk, a low risk, or what. His PDFF, as Dr. Tannenbaum has mentioned, is 12%. We like to see that number less than 5%, so this is definitely a fatty liver. 
But when we do liver multi-scan, we find that his corrected T1 is at 686, which means there's low risk for NASH and fibroinflammation, which I could rely on. And these are really good uh, real, real world cases because we coupled this information to a liver biopsy. And as you can see at the lower part of the left part of the screen, his biopsy came back as a fibrosis stage one, which is early fibrosis, and a NAS or NAFLD activity score of just two. So this is a low risk patient, which is good information for me because now I know I can just manage him conservatively, maybe some exercise and diet and manage his lifestyle. On the flip side, here's another case of a 60-year-old diabetic female. If you follow the left-hand side of the screen, you see she's a larger uh, individual with the BMI of 38. Her AST and ALT are abnormal at 50 and 58. We like to see these less than about 19 or 20 in a female. Her Fib4 is on the higher end at 2.11, and her vibration controlled transient elastography is right at 9.9. .9. So that information there tells me I might be dealing with someone who's moderate risk, but I'm not exactly sure without maybe a biopsy. And her proton density fat fraction is 12%, so obviously a, a fatty liver. But when we use the liver multi-scan in this case, the corrected T1 is very high at 978. That tells me that liver is bright red, that this patient is high risk for NASH, high risk for fibroinflammation, and that maybe I need to look a little bit deeper in this individual. And this, potential, this patient, again, is a real world example. When we coupled this information to liver biopsy, she had F2 disease, so right in the middle of um, the stage of no fibrosis and F4 cirrhosis, she was right in the middle. And her NAFLD activity score was five, so she has NASH. So this is a person that would probably benefit from a clinical trial or maybe some of the off-label interventions like vitamin E or pioglitazone. The other nice thing about liver multi-scan is that it does help you uh, understand the treatment response. So here's a nice case where we have a non-diabetic obese 54-year-old female who at baseline, the liver multi-scan showed that she had potentially NASH or aggressive disease. As you can see at baseline, her corrected T1 was 925 milliseconds. The liver is bright red and orange, and her PDFF is 13.9, um, or his PDFF is 13.9%. So we have fatty liver, aggressive disease, fibroinflammation, and now we offer this individual vitamin E, aggressive lifestyle modification, and we follow this same person up 12 months later, and as you can see on the right, the liver now is green, it's, it's, it's healthier, and the PDFF has gone down to 3%. So we've effectively treated the disease, and we've used the liver multi-scan as a gauge to help us monitor and present this to the patient. And for our patients, this is really nice because they can see the color change over time and know that they are um, truly responding to the treatment. Fatty liver disease is not the only uh, place where liver multi-scan can be helpful. We know in autoimmune hepatitis, this is a very desperate condition. People who develop autoimmune hepatitis are very um, unfortunate in the sense that we're giving them steroids and immunosuppressants and hoping that the liver won't ultimately become cirrhotic and they need a liver transplantation. And here recently we've seen um, both hepatology communications and the British Medical Journal say, wow, liver multi-scan can be our virtual biopsy. This can really help us manage these patients and understand their treatment response just by using a non-invasive technology because when I trained in the Air Force uh, here in Texas, we were biopsying everybody. If we gave someone treatment for autoimmune hepatitis, the only way for us to know if the patient was responding was to put them through a biopsy. I've biopsied people six and seven times within a, a couple of months' time, and it's really a sad thing. So to have this technology available is really game-changing. Here is um, an example of what I mean by using liver multi-scan to help us assess how our treatment response in autoimmune hepatitis is looking. On the left table, patient A is a 56-year-old individual, BMI of 23, whose labs look pretty good. ALT of 26, AST of 25, the immunoglobulin is nice and low at 11, some other liver, uh, disease, uh, liver enzymes are nice and normal. 
The PDFF is two, so not much fat in the liver, and the corrected T1 is 694, which is normal because it's below 800. This individual is on budesonide treatment. So seeing this nice bright green liver, also with a CT1 of um, 694, tells me that this is potentially a treatment uh, that uh, is working, one, and that the person may be a candidate for either uh, weaning of therapy or maybe giving them a drug holiday. So I'd be very comfortable in this individual knowing that I have a nice global representation of how the liver looks on this CT1 image. Unfortunately, liver biopsies are quite variable. You're getting a tiny piece of tissue, and so even though her labs look good and the tissue might look good, I still might be making a huge mistake by taking her, her treatment away. But it's nice to have this technology. On the opposite side of the spectrum, though, if you look at the, um, the uh, patient B, who's a 55-year-old, who, whose liver enzymes by virtue of definition are normal in the sense that the ALT and AST are below 40. Um, she's essentially met threshold for uh, clinical improvement. Her IgG is normal. Her GGT also is good. Um, but when you look at the corrected T1, it's 843, which is not normal. It is showing that bright orangey red liver. And this is an individual who's on budesonide and azathioprine. And although biochemically, you might think she's doing well, but looking at that liver on the um, liver multi-scan is telling us that she's not ready for um, a holiday or drug withdrawal and you need to continue what you're doing with treatment. So we talked about fatty liver disease, we talked about autoimmune hepatitis, and the last uh, indication I'd like to, to discuss with you is hereditary hemochromatosis and the benefit of liver iron concentration. So this is a 23-year-old male who really was just a healthy volunteer for a liver multi-scan and was found to have quite a bit of iron in the, in the liver at 4.17 milligrams of iron per uh, gram of dry weight tissue. He underwent further evaluation with genetics and lab and was found to have hereditary hemochromatosis. And after phlebotomy, 12 months later, you can see the change in the liver multi-scan in the um, liver iron concentration went down to 2.39, which is clinically meaningful and means that we effectively were able to take the iron out of the, of the liver cells. So it's really nice to see this in a uh, pictorial representation, because typically with hemochromatosis, we're looking at the ferritin dropping, the iron saturation dropping, and we're hoping that that translates to what the liver looks like, and then ultimately we would re-biopsy them. And again, this is a nice non-invasive tool which I, I wish more of us knew about. So in summary, for myself and my colleagues in the hepatology space, the liver multi-scan has really been groundbreaking technology. It has multiple metrics that are relevant and reproducible. Um, it helps us to monitor and risk stratify our patients across a spectrum of liver disease. And it's really friendly. I like the way these uh, reports are um, produced and the colors that uh, help us, even if you're not really sophisticated, to, to know what green means go and red means stop. So with that, I'd like to go to the next speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for that excellent overview. And so I'm going to uh, give you a perspective from a tertiary care setting where uh, we at um, MGH have been uh, trying this technique and you know, trying to see if we can answer the questions that uh, have primarily been posed, which is, you know, can you assess for fat iron and fibrosis? And primarily it's fat, because that's sort of the NASH-based um, um, a disease entity is, you know, is sort of the key driver here. But we need to do it in a fashion that is giving us standardized reports, uh, and we are able to do this uh, quantitative assess assessments in a consistent way, and, and the most important thing is, is it reimbursable? Because that's the first question we ask. Uh, so, you know, we had developed a metabolic liver program at our institution uh, for quite some years, but because of heterogeneity of vendors, heterogeneity of um, field strengths, uh, the problem was getting a consistent quality that was, uh, you know, reliable, and we could then sort of lay our hat on that and say this is the absolute value. And we were having issues in terms of doing fat quant and also uh, in terms of getting fibrosis estimates. So that's where sort of we were, you know, looking in the space and trying to see if we can come up with better solutions. And this was particularly important with our flagship outpatient center, which is this new... Um, it's, you know, it started right after COVID, where we have 
uh, three, uh, three Tesla uh, magnets in the same center. And what is unique about this is that uh, with this system, the, the table is dockable. So for each scanner, we have two tables. So as the patients are being scanned in these areas, uh, the, you know, the, the next patient is being prepped, the coils are being placed. So there's absolutely no dead time between going from one patient to the next. So this offers the perfect sort of environment where we seek these kind of metabolic indications, shortened, abbreviated, standardized, accurate, quantitative exams. That's what we were looking for and how we could translate that, you know, take something like uh, liver multi-scan and apply that in, in uh, this setting. And uh, also it's important because what we, whatever we are doing at this central uh, outpatient site, we are then uh, translating that across the system to our other magnets that are at, at, at the main campus and at other outpatient centers. So that's where we started, you know, we implemented Perspectum and, and the important thing is it's a 15 minute exam that is done along with MR elastography. And, and these are the steps, you know, you acquire the exam, the data is transferred to the cloud and, and just to kind of reiterate because this is a very important point, you know, data is leaving your, your system going out and it is being done in a way that is kosher, it's, you know, all the relevant, um, uh, you know, I's are dotted and T's are stroked in terms of all the, uh, uh, all the te technical uh, uh, safety issues that we have in place at our institution. The data is processed, reports come back, and then, you know, the radiologists can look at the, the nice sort of overview that was shown in terms of simplified projection of what the fat fraction is, what the iron content is, and, and what the fibrosis is it. Uh, or the, the inflammation is, and we do it in addition to MR elastography. And so this is sort of the 15 minute exam, uh, under 15 minute exam that is done. And again, the important point to emphasize here is that the heterogeneity that we see across vendor platforms with their respective quantitative uh, estimates is overcome because now you have uh, a third party solution that is independent of which vendor platform you have and which uh, field strength you're using. And then the question about uh, reimbursement, and you know, these are, um, this is a reimbursable code which can be applied to this specific exam. And it has been successfully implemented at, at other institutions and, and you know, uh, uh, the key question of who pays for it is, is I think, uh, important here in terms of you know, getting reimbursed for the exam once it is performed. One other key point to also emphasize is you know, when we asked our referrers, they always worry about if they order an exam, yes, they like the reports, they like you know, how it is presented, but what if you know, they are not able to get uh, pre-approval for this study and who takes care of that? And one thing important to emphasize is this, this is also added value in terms of what Perspectum offers in terms of helping with that process. And there's a whole team which is primarily based in US, which is uh, really um, convenient and nice because you can pick up the phone and call them in, in case there are uh, any, any challenges in terms of getting pre-approval for these exams. So these are the things that we don't have to worry about if we do LMS uh, or the liver multi-scan when we are looking at fat, iron, and, and uh, CT1 and, and inflammation. But the most important thing I would like to emphasize is quality control. You know, before, that was something that we had to spend a good amount of time, and as, uh, as was uh, mentioned earlier by Dr. Tannenbaum, is, you know, if, so, if you have to kind of pick up the phone and problem solve these issues, that can be a huge uh, uh, time sink, and you may not know the answers all the time, and this is something, you know, when, when the scan leaves your system, comes back, and they tell you that this exam is not interpretable because of the following reasons, that really uh, it helps you tremendously in terms of overcoming quality issues. And so just to kind of show you the entire spectrum, and again, uh, cases were short, but you know, you can have uh, CT1 abnormalities uh, either with or without uh, presence of fatty infiltration. And the question is, is if you have disease activity without steatosis, you know, that's also added value here because as was said earlier, is autoimmune hepatitis and you know, other causes of inflammation in the liver can be then identified and appropriately uh, stratified for adequate therapy. Not everything is NASH related in terms of CT1 abnormalities. Uh, same is with, uh, with uh, iron in terms of, and again, I'm not going to belabor the point here, but looking at liver iron concentration and then correlating that to the inflammation, not only in terms of primary assessment, but also in terms of longitudinal following these patients when adequate therapies are, are, uh, are given. And just to show you some examples of how MRE and LMS are truly complementary techniques. 
So here is a patient, um, you know, with um, a, um, a uh, increased uh, CT1 um, uh, value and nicely correlates to the MR elastography, which shows a value of uh, uh, 7.3 kilopascals in that location. So nice uh, uh, complementary correlation of MR elastography and uh, uh, multi-scan. But here is an example where there is ion deposition that confounds the uh, performance of the MR elastography. Obviously, we are using gradient echo-based uh, um, MRE acquisition still, and that can uh, null the uh, signal intensity within the liver and, and sort of not allow you to accurately interpret, but CT1 provides the complementary information here. As was said, you know, red is bad, and this clearly has an effect on the liver uh, parenchyma in terms of inflammation. And this is something that we are still studying where there is a, a disparity. So in this case, you can see that the CT1 value is abnormal, but the MR elastography gave us a you know, normal range of 2.2 kilopascals. And we have a good number of these cases, and we are still sort of assessing and seeing what the added value here is. And, and you know, in the near future, we hope to answer this question. But the important point to underscore and emphasize here is that these are two complementary tools the entire exam can be performed under, under uh, 15 minutes of acquisition. So the reality in an outpatient center that I showed you where a 30-minute time slot can actually uh, you enable or you can do two exams in that 30-minute slot is, 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 uh, is not a pipe dream anymore. It's a, it is a reality. So to, just to summarize, you know, uh, it's an effective tool in terms of providing standardized acquisition. Quality control issues are something that we, we really like about this, uh, this workflow. It is reimbursable, and again, um, the report turnaround time is fairly rapid, so uh, that can be uh, implemented successfully in a busy tertiary care clinical practice. Thank you. Should we probably uh, come up to the, to the table? So let's open the questions and answers um, session. We have uh, 15 minutes to do so. Please feel free to ask any questions that you may have uh, to our presenters. Yes, sir. Yeah, no, we do have biopsies. I think I'm loud enough. We do have biopsies in those specific cohort of patients, and we are looking at it right now. Uh, uh, we have our uh, histologists kind of help us analyze the data to see what is the meaning of the dis you know, disparity that we see. Uh, and I don't have a good answer for you right at this minute, but we hopefully look forward to publishing the data. Thank you. I have a question that T1 is like a 2D or 2D thing. So how much of the liver is covered on the, on the T1 map? It is a 2D map and it's... Can you, it's can, you can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. This one. The question is... The question is, is it a 2D or a 3D technique? Uh, and it's a 2D acquisition, single slice. We acquire a, a specific number of slices and the data that you see on the on the 2D image okay. of what that slice it gives you the entire uh, volume of uh, tissue that gives the CT1. Thank you. What about if you have a polycystic or the clips that you're doing artifacts and the measurement also? Yeah, I mean, in the clips are always going to be an issue no matter. But you have slices above and below, so it's not an issue there. So, so we are uh, trying to implement the Devamoti scan for clinical care, and uh, the issue we are having is that um, it's difficult to tell if a clinician wants liver multi scan or or the standard uh, quant exam. And the implication, the billing implication is huge because there's complete different pathway of um, for billing. So it's it's really easy to make make a mistake, and uh, especially you know when the the trainees are uh, working through a long protocol list. How, how, do you, how, how do you deal with that at MGH? Yeah, so that's actually a very important point. Uh, so the way we have dealt with that is we have created an EPIC orderable in our system that funnels the uh, patient specifically for this exam. 
And so, uh, you know, we have also gone a little bit extra in the sense that as I showed you the outpatient center, so it's not only the orderable and funneling it to this specific uh, performable, but it also gets uh, triaged to that specific site as well, which is a little bit unusual at our practice, but you know, you don't want to restrict your exam to one specific site, but given that we have the bandwidth to do the exams there, and since you know, they are our premier site, that's what we are trying to do. But I think having an epic order, orderable definitely helps. Dr. Gunn, are you using this for biopsy? <clears throat> Sounds like you're getting a biopsy. We're not using it for biopsy guidance. In other words, where do you biopsy? Is it the most abnormal areas in the scan? No, we're not using it as a, a means to, oh, the question was, do you use this as a, a means to determine where to biopsy? No, we're still biopsying essentially ultrasound guided, blind type of biopsies, that's still the same. We're just using this more as a, way, a means to risk stratify our patients who may warrant more information to get a biopsy, if that makes sense. But we're not using it as a, where to geographically locate our needle. Uh, my question was, uh, you're, it sounds like you're performing this on 3T scanners. Have you encountered a situation where an excessive amount of iron kind of renders, you know, uh, iron quantification and correcting the T1 for that amount of iron uh, not possible? Yeah, I, again, that's an excellent uh, question. Um, the answer is, uh, you know, the volume that we have done thus far, no, but obviously as we do more cases, we will come across scenarios where that may become an issue, and uh, that may be something we'll have to work with the LMS or Perspectrum folks to figure out you know, how best to answer. But as of now, at least in the volume that we have done, we haven't encountered those issues. So uh, it sounds like you are uh, performing this with elastography, but the clinical guidelines suggest either uh, the liver multi-scan or elastography. Are the uh, insurance companies billing kind of reimbursing you for both? Uh, so the, the uh, code that we mentioned earlier, that's the one we are using. And as of now, we haven't had any, we haven't had any issues. But again, you know, as we do more of these, you know, time will tell. I, I think that is one key thing to monitor and determine in terms of you know, reimbursement is certainly going to be an important factor. Because the, the workflow is slightly different here from what we do, right? I mean, you acquire the exams, you send it out, and you are paying the vendor, the third party vendor, per scan that you do. So uh, there is a certain element of risk sharing. You know, if we get paid, then they get, they get paid. But the question is, uh, is that something uh, that we need, we need to, you know, is that sustainable? But I think that's where the billing issues are going to be key. So you're not, you're not billing separately for elastography? No. OK. No. How often you observe that the um, Elastography is inconsistent with T1. How often you see this? A very small percentage or high? Yeah, it's, it's a small, small percentage of cases. And that's what I was saying, that we have biopsy proof, but we have to put the entire clinical picture together to understand what really is going on. Would it be quite low? It's not quite new, but some information, but not to say too much that come from those. Andrew, you have something to say? John, sorry, sorry, Jonathan. No, I just presented here yesterday morning at like, I don't know, 7.08 a.m. in autoimmune. And I presented here yesterday in the scientific session on autoimmune hepatitis in children and young adults from a registry we have at Cincinnati Children's where kids get a research MRI and a biopsy within six months. And when we looked at, we have stiffness, we have T1 values, and then you know, we have anthropomorphics and labs and that sort of thing. When things go multivariable in auto, this is not NASH, this is not NAFLD, this is autoimmune hepatitis and PSC, the T1 value is correlated with histologic inflammation and the liver stiffness value is correlated with fibrosis. That's a study NM1. Yeah, we've got to do more of these studies, but I really think that it may be the MGH approach here where they're complementary, and we get you know, more inflammation data from this and then more fibrosis data from the elastography. I have yeah, two thank questions. you, Dr. Dillman. Sorry, my apologies. I have two questions. So what percentage of, um, like, the build professional fee goes to the radiologist and to the third party vendor. That's my first question. And the second one is, uh, so am I correct in assuming what CT1 is measuring is some combination of fibrosis minus the liver iron element, liver iron concentration element of it? Yeah, so the first, I, I don't know, Carlos, do you want to, based on your 
you know, overall experience with reimbursement. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't hear the question, I'm sorry. Uh, in terms of the billing, how much of it goes for the technical and professional component? For the third party that are Heather, providing them. will you take that one? Yeah, so there's a technical component that gets reimbursed by Medicare today at $950 in the hospital setting. Commercial payers typically pay about one and a half times that much. Our charge per scan ranges uh, typically around $700. So there's still um, money going back to the facility. And then additionally, there's a professional fee that the radiology or the interpreting physician would get compensated for. And we don't touch that. So 700 of 950 for Medicare, plus your, you'd also get your professional fee, or you know, around 12 to 1500. I'm sorry? So the hospital gets reimbursed for the MR scan itself, then additionally the LMS, the liver multi-scan test um, for the facility, and then there's professional fees, both for the MR interpretation and the liver multi-scan interpretation. So it, it is treated by Medicare and payers as a separate test from the MR, or if you're doing the MRE, that would get reimbursed separately. I'd like to know if uh, ascites decreases the reliability of the study. Not, not in our experience, so. Um, I think we may have to stop there because there is a uh, session that is going to stop in five minutes. Um, we have Dr. Eamon here, who is uh, MR elastography. Any closing remarks? <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming, and I hope that this was useful for you. Thank you.